Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Another day. We're glad. We're rejoicing in it. I'm giving God praise that he's kept us all week long and allowed us to see another Lord's Day that we come together to worship and magnify his name. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. You know, every week I'm always excited and thankful to God for the privilege and opportunity to do what I do and to be among people who love the Lord. I'm here in our control room where there are faithful, dedicated servants who make it possible for this uh, service to be streamed to you every week. And I'm grateful to God for each of them. Today I'm ministering in part two of a series I did, started last Sunday, on Jonah. And today we'll be in chapter two of the book of Jonah. Grab your Bibles. We're going to talk about Jonah's prayer. Jonah prayed, and his prayer resulted in change in his circumstances. The God that we serve wants to bring change to your circumstances. But what are you praying? And are you praying? Grab your Bibles. We'll be going to the Word of God in just a few moments. Have a great day and a marvelous week. God bless you. You can be seated, grab your Bibles, and turn it to the book of Jonah. I don't have as much time as I normally have, so I want you all to jump on board with me real quick. Tell your neighbor, jump on board real quick. A woman, I met a lady today after the 10 o'clock service who came to service today. She, she came and traveled from her home to come and visit us for the, for the first time. She came all the way from her home just to attend the First Baptist Church of Denmark. She's been watching us on YouTube. She came from Germany. That's amazing. She real, that was a real encouragement to me. I told the church in our church business meeting, we average 36, 37,000 people on a weekend who watch our services on a weekend, 37,000 people. I'm honored. Today is part two of this series we started last week on Jonah. Last week, part one was called The Predicament. Say, The Predicament. Say, The Predicament. That was last week, The Predicament. We talked about the predicament that Jonah was in. Jonah had been given instructions by God to go down to preach to the people in Nineveh. He instead decided to go to Tarshish. He decided to go in the opposite direction than where God had instructed him. And so he finds himself disobeying God and he ends up getting aboard a ship. They, they leave to head toward Tarshish and they end up in a storm. And in the middle of this storm, the sailors on board the ship recognize that somebody on the ship has made God angry. So they're trying to figure out who it is and they cast lots and the scripture says that the lots fell on Jonah. It's determined that Jonah is the problem. These soldiers have done everything in their power to try to stabilize the ship. They threw stuff off overboard. They threw cargo and valuable stuff overboard. But yet no matter the harder they tried to row the boat and get it safe, the storm got worse. So they cast a lot and they said, Jonah, it falls on Jonah. They discover that Jonah is the problem. And Jonah says, yes, I was supposed to do something. God told me to go to preach and I didn't go and so I'm the problem. And so he says to them what a lot of you say to people, throw me overboard. He should have threw his own self overboard. Some of you are in situations in life that you want other people to do for what, for, to do something that you should be able to do yourself. Amen. He knew he was the problem. He should have threw his old self overboard, but he didn't. But he stayed on board the ship and created drama for everybody else. When you disobey God, you not only create drama for you, you create drama for everybody else that's on your ship. I think I told you last week that while Jonah was, while the ship was wrestling and going through this storm, Jonah is downstairs in the belly of the ship sleep. While you're trying to fight to pay bills, the person who should be helping you is laid up watching television. I think I told you that last week. Ain't trying to get no job. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. Ain't making no effort. So in time, they decided to throw Jonah overboard. And the moment they, this is important, the moment they threw Jonah overboard, the storm ceased. Some of you, the moment you get some people out of your life that ain't supposed to be in your life, your drama is going to cease. 
I know y'all don't like that kind of preaching because y'all like to keep certain kind of people in your life. You want to keep on rolling, but they're creating drama. So Jonah, they throw him overboard. And, and the thing I love about God, because in verse 17 of, of chapter 1, they throw, um, um, the men threw, threw him overboard. And in chapter, seven, chapter 1, verse 17, he said, The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I love that because God had already prepared protection for Jonah once he decided to make the right choice. And so he jumped overboard and God had prepared the fish. Y'all are, are scared to get people out of your life because you're afraid what's going to happen to them. And I told y'all last week, God's already got their future prepared. You just need to get them out of your life. And so what do you do when you're in the belly of a whale? What do you do when you're, in the belly, when you're in the middle of a problem, when you got drama going on and you're in the middle of it, what do you do? The whole second chapter of Jonah is about him praying. That's what you do, you pray. And praying is an, is an important thing because the enemy does not want you to have a prayer life. The devil does not want you to pray. The last few weeks I've been talking about the importance of prayer, that God is calling us back to a place and a season of prayer, that we got to learn to commune and talk with God and walk with God and and lay out burdens with God and talk to God every day. To, you don't have to start a certain time, end a certain time. You don't have to face a certain way, be in a certain position. Pray. Somebody say pray. Pray while you're walking. Pray while you're working. Pray while you're jogging. Pray while you're driving. Pray. Pray while your boss is cussing you out. Pray while, pray while, just pray. Learn how to talk and commune with God all the time. Tell your neighbor, learn how to pray all the time. The devil does not want you to pray. He wants you to feel guilt and shame and the devil wants you to think of all the things you did wrong and all the things you didn't do right for you not to pray. That's what the devil wants. But God desires a relationship with you where you commune and talk with him on a regular, all the time. The thing I love about God is that he wants us to bring our cares and concerns to him all the time. It doesn't matter where you are, what you've done, how bad you've fallen. It doesn't matter what it is. God desires to converse with you. And here Jonah is who disobeyed God. He disobeyed God. He went in the opposite direction. As a matter of fact, he was told to go to Tarshish, Nineveh. He went to Tarshish, 2,200 miles difference between the two places. He's going in. He, it's like him going, he's supposed to be going to New York, but he's going to California. I felt something when I said that. Some of y'all, somebody here supposed to go in one direction but you went in the opposite direction and here he is trying to get as far away from God as he can and God sees where he is and interrupts his journey and he ends up in the belly of a whale and what do you do when you're in the belly of a whale and you've disobeyed God here's what you do you pray now, if you read chapter 2, I'm in chapter 2, verse 1 says, Then Jonah prayed. I think that's funny. Then he prayed. You should have prayed before you got on board the ship and went in another direction. <laughs> then he prayed after he had disobeyed God. Now he wants to, he's in the belly of this, this fish, and now he wants to pray. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. And he said, now look, this is key. Are y'all with me? Y'all following me right here? In verse 2, he says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Shoel, I cried, and you heard my voice. Stick a pen right there. Stop for a second. There's two words I want you to notice, but they're the same word. It's the word cried. He says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. He cried. He said, I cried. Somebody say cried. cried. Then he says again, out of the belly of Shoel, I cried. There's he, there he mentions it twice. He cried. He cried. It's, it's the same English word, but it's two different Hebrew words. The first word cried, that first word cried, actually means that he called God out by name. Now that's an important thing because a lot of people are praying, but they're not praying to the right God. You don't pray generically to any God. You got to be sure that you're praying to the God to whom you serve. That's important because some people are just praying and talking to anybody, they're talking to themselves, they're talking to some God or some spirit. Or, I mean, no, no, no. He prayed to the Lord. He prayed to Jehovah. He called him out by name. And what I believe that means is this. I believe it means when we come to God, we are not generic with God. We are specific with God. 
You be specific with them. You tell God exactly what it is you want God to do for you. Be specific. Somebody say specific. You have to be specific with God because he is a... He's a... He is a detail-oriented God. He's detail-oriented. Tell your neighbor, he's detail-oriented. He cried out to God, and that's the first word, cried. It means he talked specifically to the God that we serve, Jehovah. He called him out by name, called God out by name. But then the second word, cried, here means, it means it's a different Hebrew word, and what that word means is he hollered. He hollered, he cried, he, he opened his mouth. See, I watch some of y'all pray week after week, but you never open your mouth. You never want to get in a place where you are too ashamed to open your mouth and talk to God. I mean, so there come seasons and times you got to cry. You got to let the tears flow. You got to let the snot come out your nose. You, you got to cry out to God. God wants us crying out to him. And I'm telling you, when you get in the belly of a whale, you will cry out. I, I'm saying, don't wait till you get in the belly of a whale. Get into the practice of crying out to God now. I know y'all concerned about what people going to say and what they're going to think and what the person on the other side thinks about you. You better forget about those people. They don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. They can't deliver you. You better learn to open your mouth and cry out to God. I can't explain this, but all I know is there's something spectacular with God when you are not ashamed to open your mouth and pour out your heart to God and say, I need thee, Lord, I need you. I need you to order my steps and I need you to answer my prayer. And there's something spectacular with God that will cause his ear to be bent in your direction. But no, you want to be cute. You, want to you don't want to mess up your do. You don't, want get, you don't want your mascara to get messed up. But I'm telling you, you will, if you don't learn to cry out to God, you will get into a situation where you don't care what people think about what you look like or what you sound like. Jonah's in the belly of this well and he cries out, he hollers, he, he opens his mouth. The situation he ends required him to cry out to God and he did. He hollered and he cried out to the Lord and, and he prayed. That brings me to my first point. Jonah prayed, listen to this, from the position of his wretchedness. He was in a wretched condition and he still prayed. Now why is that important? Because the devil wants you to think that when you get in a bad situation, you can't pray. Matter of fact, some of your theology has you thinking that you have to get in a certain place with God before you can pray. You can talk to God, I don't care how jacked up you is. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, right here it says in verse two, that uh, verse 2 says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. Somebody say affliction. And the word affliction means to be in a tight situation, a tight spot, to be in trouble. He was in a tight spot. Somebody's here today, you're in a tight spot. You, it means you don't know which way to go. You can't go forward, you can't go backwards, you can't go left, you can't go right. You, can't, you don't know what to do. You can't go up, you can't go down. You have no place to turn. Your situation is so dramatic, you don't know what to do because there's nothing for you to do. Your back is against the wall. You're in a horrible situation, but God specializes in helping people in tight situations. It means to be tight in a tight situation and it means to be in trouble. You're in a troubled posture. It's in trouble. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to do about your kids. You don't know what to do about your finances. You don't know what to do about your marriage. You don't know what to do about your job. But you just know you're in trouble. Not only has he got this affliction, not only is he in a tight spot, not only is he in trouble, but he also says right here, out of the belly of Shoel, uh, Shoel it's, it's the belly of hell. He was in a hellish situation. Some of y'all don't recognize that you're in a hellish situation. It means the word hell there means to be in the world of the dead, a pit. You're in a place where there's no life, no hope, no peace. There's nothing positive about where you are. And that's where he is. This man is in, in a place of certain death. It is like he's going to die. But he cried out to God. I love that. He cried out to God. But here's the deal. He says in verse 3, look at verse 3. 
For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Listen there. He, look at what he said. You cast me into the deep. He understood he was being disciplined by God. I need to stick a pin there because somebody asked me the other day, is it possible that God is punishing you? Let me tell you something. God sometimes I, I know y'all don't like this kind of preacher but I need to tell you this real quick sometimes God will bring drama in your life to get your attention and 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 Jonah was wise enough to recognize that he was in the dilemma he was in because he disobeyed God he said you cast me into the deep into the hearts of the sea and the flood surrounded me and your billows and your waves passed over me he recognized verse 5 the water surrounded me even to my soul the deep closed around me weeds were wrapped around my head I'm coming back to that he, he recognized that he's in a troubled situation this is trouble it's drama it's pain it's a terrible condition and a bad situation and that's where he is weeds are wrapped around his head it says in verse number five the, the water surrounded me even to my soul the deep closed around me weeds were wrapped around my head around my head not only is he listen ooh, ooh, ooh. not only slow down pastor slow down slow down not only is he just surrounded physically he's surrounded emotionally and psychologically listen to what he says he said I got weeds wrapped around my head he had weeds around his physical head because he's in the belly of the whale but he also had some weeds around his mental thinking he wasn't thinking right how you know he wasn't thinking right because he says some things in the midst of this drama that he's in is just not true that are not he said in verse 4 look at verse 4 he said I have been cast out of your sight He's, he's saying, God, you can't see me. His thinking is askewed. Because you, you, and some of y'all think that you could go places that God doesn't see you. <laughs> but you need to know no matter where you are, God can see you. Even in the belly of the well, God can see him. Even in the pit of hell, God can see you. I did I tell y'all this last week? Even when you in the hotel, God can see you. He, even when you go to the club. Did I tell the 12 o'clock crowd this last Sunday? Even at the club, God can see you. His thinking is twisted that he thinks God can't see him. He's in a horrible situation, but God still sees him. He is in a troubled posture. Verse number seven, he said, my soul fainted within me. And I remembered the Lord. Who? that's the greatest thing he could have done is when he got with his back up against the wall to start remembering God. He find, matter of fact, somebody, let me, ooh, ooh, I'm trying to rush and I'm forgetting some important things that I need to say. I need y'all to know that when God punishes you, when God disciplines you, because Job, Jonah is being disciplined by God, when God disciplines you, it's not to cause you pain. God's not trying to hurt you. The purpose of discipline is not pain. The purpose of discipline is your change. Yeah. Tweet that. Instagram that. Snapchat that. What's the other one? Instagram that. God's not trying to change. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to change you. That's what it's about. And the moment you make up your mind to change, your situation will change. Somebody tell your neighbor, your situation will change. Somebody holler. Tell your neighbor, your situation will change. Y'all didn't say it. I need you to have an attitude with it. Say, your situation will change. He's in a troubled situation, and he's troubled. He's troubled, and he's, he's in... He's in He's in a bad place. Verse 8, he says, those who regard, verse 8, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Those who forsake worthless idols, who regard, I'm sorry, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. In other words, when you put idols that are worthless before your relationship with God, you forsake the mercy that God gives to you. 
It is God who woke you up and gave you the activities of your limbs and protected you and guided you. And somehow or another, Jonah comes to the realization that he put his idols in front of God. He put, and some of y'all have put your idols in your career, in your job, in your house, in your car, in your clothes. And you put all that stuff before God. And when you put it before God and obeying God and serving God, you are in essence forsaking the mercy of God. It's God that gave you the ability to have the job to get what you got in the first place. But you forsake that. You have forsaken that. He says you have forsaken. The scripture is crystal clear. Jonah recognizes this and says, when you, when, you give worth, when you give worth to worthless things, you forsake the mercy of God. But by the time we get, before we get to verse 9, there's some shift that begins to happen in Jonah's wretchedness his idea his prayer he goes from he, he he mentions and he begins to do something in the midst of his prayer that I think is important that I want to encourage all of you to do yes you're in a wretched condition but point two Jonah, Jonah prayed from a posture of worship what does that mean here's what it means it means why you're praying intermingle in your request with God the fact that you know that he's worthy to be praised I believe that worshiping God is a key component to your prayer life. Somebody say, worship God. Everybody didn't say it. Maybe I should say, everybody should say, worship God. Everybody say, worship God. Look at what he said in verse number four. He said, I have been cast out of your sight. That was his deception. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I love that. Here's what he's saying. I feel like you don't see me, but yet even though I don't think you see me, I'm still looking forward to the day when I'll get back to the temple. Here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. As soon as I get out of this dilemma, I'm going, I'm going to make my way to church. As soon, as soon as I get out of the belly of this well, I'm going to go and worship God. And I don't know where y'all are, but I love to be in church. I love the church of God. I love being around the people of God. I love to sing with the people of God. I love to pray with the people of God. It's something about being in God's temple that brings peace and calmness and confidence in me. There's something about the fact that when God's people get together, he dwells in the midst. He inhabits the praises of his people. And when we all get together and worship him, Anything can happen in here when we all get together. Miracles can happen in here when we all get together. Breakthrough can happen in here when we get together. Anybody know what I'm talking about? High five your neighbor and say anything can happen in here. This is the atmosphere for miracles I think somebody just said. This is the place where I can believe and see God. See, here's why it's important for me to make my way to church. Because when I come to church and I look around, I see that person over there that I saw God heal their marriage. That makes me know my marriage can be healed. And I look over there and I see somebody whose child was strung out on drugs, but they came off drugs. And it inspires me to know that if God did it for them, he can do the same thing for me. When I look over there and I saw that person didn't have enough money to pay their bills, but God somehow bought some money and paid their bills, it makes me know God can pay my bills. Do I have a witness anywhere in the camp? Do I have anybody that knows that there's something about being in the house of God around the people of God and Jonah said I'm looking forward to that day when I'll make it back to your holy temple he says I'm gonna look again towards your temple and I'm getting there I'm going to he, he not only worships God from that vantage point hallelujah by the way you know the devil wants to do everything he can to keep you out of church he wants to frustrate you. He wants to make you get problems with people in church. He wants you to misunderstand something that the pastor said and you get all screwed and mad so I ain't never going back to that church no more. That's the devil. You know what I want you to know? I don't care where you are in life, always make your way back to the church of God. It, I, I don't care. I don't care how drunk you are. Drag your stinking drunk self right on up here in the church. I don't care how high you are, come in here as high as a kite. And we're going to 
going to preach the gospel and the gospel will sober you up and change you and deliver you and transform you. Make your way here. Somebody say, I'm going to look again toward the holy temple. Tell them, tell them. I'm going to look again toward, but oh, he didn't stop there. Don't let the, my point is, don't let the devil keep you out of church. But he didn't stop there. I like what he said in verse 6. He says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains, and the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet, you have brought up my life from the pit. I like, you know what I'm liking about this? He is praising God and worshiping God for what God is going to do, even, God ain't, even though God hasn't done it yet. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. You got to learn to give God praise about what you want him to do before he even does it. Woo! You got to thank him for the miracle before the miracle gets here. Thank him for the healing before the healing gets there. Thank him for the breakthrough before the breakthrough gets there. Learn to worship God even though it has not even happened yet. Somebody shake somebody's hand and say, I'm going to go ahead and give him praise right now. I'm thanking, I'm going to thank him. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to worship him. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I believe it's going to happen. And his credit is good enough for me to go ahead and praise him ahead of time. Somebody say, yet you did bring me out, yet you did change me, yet you did transform, yet, yet, yet you did it. Oh, wait a minute. Some of y'all didn't get it. Maybe this will help you. Verse 9 says, verse 9 says, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. Y'all missed a great spot to say amen again. I, who am I preaching to? Somebody been complaining to God and moping to God and crying to God, but he told me to tell you, stop moping, stop crying, stop complaining, give him thanks. He's working on your dilemma. He's working on your situation. He already got your back covered. Go ahead and give him thanks. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for every miracle. I thank you for what you've done already, what you're doing right now, and what you are going to do. Anybody, anybody can praise God after the miracle is done. Anybody can shout after the bill gets paid. But can you, can you praise him before it happens? him while you're in the belly of the fish can you praise him when the divorce papers come land at your desk can you still praise him can you praise him when the doctor said there's nothing else we can do can you still give him thanks hope God raise up some people in this camp that will not mind praising you and blessing you and giving you thanks Thank you, 
Now I don't know, I don't know who I'm preaching to. All I know is that you're here. Stop complaining. And while you're in the middle of your tears, pull yourself together and say, God, I give you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Let me close. Y'all supposed to say, take your time, but that's all right. When, listen, when he got to a place of thanksgiving, he was willing to change. Because in verse 9, the second part of verse 9, he says, I will pay what I have vowed. See, people need help to change. And, and what you need to do is begin to give God thanks. And when he started giving God thanks, his attitude changed. He said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do what God told me to do. I'm going to go ahead and pay my vows. I'm going to go ahead. Listen to this. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and go preach in Nineveh. And when he said that, verse 10 says, the Lord spoke to the fish. All you need is for God to speak to your situation. a word from God when Jesus was on board the ship Jesus was on board the ship in Matthew 14 when he was on board the ship and they were in the middle and they were in the middle of a storm he said peace be still all it takes is a word one of the soldiers said I got a child at home sick you ain't got to come to my house but if you just speak the word The Lord spoke to the fish. My God, I sure feel like preaching right now. He spoke to the fish. And the Bible said the fish vomited him on the dry land. Not only did he get out of the fish, he got delivered to some dry land. God wants to answer you. All you need him to do is speak. Here are my two boys right here, Joshua and uh, Jimmy. These are my two sons right here. They, they, write, they write plays, so they, they got a play coming up uh, the end of August at, where's it gonna be at? Flowers High School, y'all try to go to his play. Anyway, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy right here, Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy the one who caused me so much drama. Jimmy, the one, if we had had him first, there would be no other kids after him. Oh yeah, he, he's the one that created the most drama, the hard and strong-willed, just drama. But Jimmy, I, that strong-willedness in him has created something. He's, he, he, this is a young man who wrote a play. He wrote a play wrote the play, put it on in theaters, took the money he made from the play, and went and bought some video equipment, and took the play and made it into a movie. Yeah, him. Then he took the movie and showed it around the different places around the country, different churches. Then he got hired to work for Tyler Perry. While he's working 
for Tyler Perry, the guy, some of the people who work for Tyler Perry making movies saw his movie and said, what we want to do is help make your movie, your little, your little uh, homemade movie, we want to make it into a real movie. The problem is, he has to raise a million dollars. I ain't got no million dollars. He ain't got no million dollars. But he got a call a few weeks ago where some people said, we are gonna give you the million dollars. Two or three people, God's still talking, he's still speaking. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jimmy just straight me out. I didn't get it right. They didn't give him a million dollars. They gave him 1.5 million. I'm gone. Jimmy, you know you've been my favorite child. <laughs> if God could take this hard head boy and transform his life, he can do the same thing in your life. But you gotta be willing to be like Jonah. You gotta be willing to obey God. Some of you are not obeying God. You're disobeying God. Something you're supposed to be walking with God, but you're not walking with it. He's, he's called some of you to get saved and give your life, but you keep pushing it off because you have given more regard to worthless things, worthless items, idols, than the mercy of God. God spared your life because he wants to save you today. Today. If you're not saved, you need to come on and get saved right now. That's what you need to do. Right this moment, right this instant. Jesus Christ loves you. Died on the cross for your sins. Wants to have life with you. And he's calling you to come. If you're backslidden and you drifted away, obey God and come and dedicate, rededicate yourself. Maybe you have doubts and God's can tell you you need to be assured. Make your way down here. Or maybe you're here today and you are, you need a church. You're not saved, but you need a church. Come on right now while the blood is running warm in your veins. Come.